So today we've got about uh, seven hours together, but I think it'll probably go quite quickly. So I thought we'd start with a, a bit of a Dhamma reflection and then have a guided meditation, which will take us to lunch. Uh, then we'll have our lunch and perhaps have a little walk to the beach in silence. So that'll be an opportunity just to be with the body, but also open to whatever's happening outside and see how that affects you and how much beauty you can pick up in the nature which is often a nice way into the beauty of the mind. And mm. then in the afternoon we'll have another reflection and some guided meditation and end with a discussion and some meta meditation. So that's how the day's going to look. But it's very organic, actually, and do feel free to leave the room at any time, even if it's a session, you know, just go out quietly if, if you need to. So the whole idea is we can really relax here. And I know it's quite um, cosy, so we'll just look for like the benefits that that gives us. One of them is that you can kind of quite easily disappear into the crowd, maybe have a sense of being held by everybody here, and um, yeah, and just relax and share together. So yeah, so I chose this subject, which is a little bit um, obscure, um, not so that you could come here and get a, a makeover, although. <laughs> I forgot my razor blade, which is a shame, because you'd be getting a monastic <laughs> maker. <laughs> but because beauty is a quality within ourselves, and so often we tend to you know, focus on external beauty and what it means societally and conventionally to appear beautiful. But there is a relationship between you know, body and mind, and I think, you know, for me, the most beautiful people I see are those who have cultivated goodness in their heart. And they tend to radiate that beauty. You know, the Buddha was known as being very um, charismatic and radiant, and his presence attracted people. And um, I have my own experience in Burma with my teacher, um, who I ordained with the first time. And uh, when I went there first time, his monastery was actually, it hadn't started yet, it was just um, a rural area with a couple of buildings, no kitchen. But I was so desperate to ordain, I just said, I've got to go there now. And he said, but I'm not there yet, I'm coming in two weeks. I said, but I've got to go, you know, I can't wait any longer. So I went there. <laughs> and uh, he organised, actually, for a lady in the village to come every day and feed us. And she walked two miles every day with home-cooked food for two weeks. And uh, far better food, I'm sure, than she herself ate. And when he finally arrived in the monastery, I just remember him walking towards the hut, and he just kept coming, and I was thinking, gosh, he's really coming to do Todd's, you know. And there was this radiance, and I swear, at that time, I thought, this is why they say the Buddha has, like, seven colours, you know, coming out from his body, because it really looked that way. There was just so much purity and joy, you know. And I think also finding that we were happy there, we'd settled ourselves, we were, you know, basically there to practice and, yeah, be part of this new monastery. So... Yeah, so of course the aim isn't physical beauty, it, and even from the goodness that we practice, it's the inner beauty. And goodness isn't about, you know, keeping the rules and doing what we're supposed to do, it's a kind of authenticity which comes through generosity, a sense of gratitude, a sense of service, and just that wish to give without expecting anything else in return. And the Buddha, this is something that can be trained, it's not only the qualities that we have in our heart, but they can be developed. And the Buddha said throughout the suttas, you know, that um, these wholesome qualities should be repeatedly cultivated and developed, and the unwholesome ones we should make an effort to abandon. So the path is about stopping the negativities as far as we can from kind of entering in and then from, you know, increasing, but also about developing the good. And I think of it as um, sort of you have a home and you want to keep out the burglars or whatever. The best thing to do is not necessarily put gates and barriers, but just to keep your friends in the house. So your friends kind of create this nice energy and everybody's having a good time and the burglars know it so they don't come close because the power of goodness is so much stronger. You know, it tends to keep out the, the negatives. But at the same time, I want to talk about beauty as an attitude um, because beauty shouldn't exclude what's difficult or what's, you know, maybe the qualities in ourselves that we, we can't accept. We need to include all of that in. So it's not only, you know, what we look at and what we cultivate, but how we look at our experience. And um, this is the teaching on right attitude, which I'll go into in more detail in the second part of the day. So, um, you know, many wonderful things can come through having to face struggles in life. And, you know, the Buddha's teaching on, on suffering was what attracted me to the path, because I had my own suffering, which 
didn't seem to emanate from anything external. You know, I had a nice life, a nice family, and everything was going well. I was about to do my A levels and go to uni, etc., etc. And I suddenly thought, hang on a minute, is this what I want? Does this give me any meaning in life? I don't even know why I'm here or what life's about yet. And I, I just went through such a huge existential kind of angst and kind of despair, really, um, thinking, well, why am I here, you know? But something in me knew that there was a reason. And that led me to travel to India. And um, as soon as I heard the teachings on suffering, it was a big relief. I thought, this is something I've always known, and I've always felt there was something wrong with me, you know, for suffering. And now the Buddha's actually saying this is the first noble truth. It's something that is a universal reality for all beings everywhere, just through the virtue of being alive, being born, you know. We suffer, we're in bound to encounter difficulties, sicknesses, things not going our way, or things going our way and then falling apart, you know. This is just part of what it is to be alive. So what's the point of that, you know, if it's just about suffering? But the Buddha said, well, actually, there's suffering, but through understanding suffering, there's a way out. And for me, just hearing this was enough to, you know, set me on the path, and I knew I can't lose this, this is my path, this is what I've always been looking for, you know and there's an actual practice. <coughs> so this is where the training in beauty comes in. So I think uh, one of the big difficulties most of the time that we struggle with in life, and especially in a society which, you know, there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of expectation, and especially in the West, we're sort of trained to be quite fault-finding towards ourselves and towards other people. And uh, this fault-finding mind is actually a huge hindrance to the practice. It's uh, part of the first hindrance of ill will. And um, I think we're very good at turning that towards ourselves, to the extent that we feel sometimes we don't deserve happiness. We don't deserve to feel at ease or to feel relaxed. And we actually have this sort of instinctive resistance to taking in like the love and the joy that is available to us in life whether through nature or through, you know, the things which others give us, like the love which others wish to give us. You know, I often notice that it's very hard for people to take compliments. You know, you sort of say, well, you're doing really well, I'm really seeing a lot of uh, good qualities in you, you inspire me. No, 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 no. <laughs> and uh, apparently there's been some research on that, and uh, you take in an insult within like a couple of seconds, if not before you actually hear the words, you know. But mm. praise takes something like 30 seconds to start going in, just to start going in, because we have this resistance which has been, been conditioned by society, by our own upbringing, you know, that we're not good enough. And I suffer from this too. I mean, I went through quite a difficult time in Australia a while ago, and uh, I remember phoning Ajahn Brahm up and just saying, you know, oh, it's so hard, and, and then I just said kind of in despair, what's wrong with me? And he said, you know, the only thing that's wrong with you is that you think there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and it was so great. I was like, oh, really? You mean? <laughs> so it's the attitude, you know, that's the, that's the issue. And this sort of conditioning to always turn to the faults and try and fix things up. So we can bring this attitude into our meditation, and most of us do. I mean, a lot of us come to the practice because we feel we need to improve or, you know, become better people. It's all well motivated, but it's not quite the path because it still has that tendency to look for the faults and what's lacking. And there's actually a lot which is already good. <laughs> so the Buddha talked about happiness. He talked about pursuing one's own happiness. And there's a lovely sutta which I have here called the Aranavibhanga Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. So I thoroughly recommend getting into the text and maybe, you know, listening to some teachers who draw out certain parts of the texts. But this, I think, is the central message, really, to the path, because obviously happiness is the outcome of letting go of suffering. It's not only about experiencing and understanding suffering, but cultivating the happiness. So he says that, um, just so you know that it's okay to be happy, <laughs> the Buddha says, one should know how to define pleasure and knowing that, one should pursue pleasure within oneself. Okay? So we can pursue pleasure, but how do we define it? That's the first question. And I often think happiness, pleasure, is not quite the right word for what we're cultivating through practice. I think of it more as contentment. 
you know, the kind of happiness that doesn't need to depend on sensual pleasure or even, you know, happy experiences in the, in the world which are quite wholesome. It doesn't depend on that. It depends on a kind of contentment which is within. So content to see that change, consent to, you know, to experience the difficulties in life too. Content knowing that it will pass and that this is part of life. Not only will it pass, but it can be an opportunity to transform suffering into compassion, into wisdom. Often the people who are the most compassionate or have the ability to empathize are those who've been through similar experiences to us. And I often keep this in mind, you know, when I'm going through something that I can't see the meaning in, I think, well, you know, once I've been through this, I'll empathize much more with others who've been through something similar. So that gives it a meaning straight away, and it's almost worth going through it because then you know that you'll be able to support someone else too. So basically, the pleasure that the Buddha does say that we should pursue, he says here, first of all, yeah, first of all, I'll say the one which we shouldn't actually. So he says, the pursuit of the enjoyment of one whose pleasures is linked to sensual desire is the wrong way and is beset, I'm changing the order a bit, is a state beset by suffering, vexation, despair and fever. Okay? So of course there's gratification in sense pleasures, we all know that, and that's, you know, sense pleasures at the sense door of sight or the nose or the physical sensations, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a sort of moral evaluation that we shouldn't be experiencing any kind of happiness through those sense doors. But it's more a reflection that these things, are they, they don't last. And they, the Buddha likens that kind of um, desire to a debt. Because we start off feeling we have plenty, but slowly we kind of invest so much in those pleasures that sometimes we're left to repay them afterwards. I mean, one of the obvious things there is, say, a relationship which is a little bit misguided, you know, and there's a lot of pleasure in the beginning, but it's unhealthy. You know, we have to pay that back later because we didn't have the full picture, you know, maybe we didn't use enough wisdom in entering into that. So that's one of the problems. And also this um, idea of the law of diminishing returns. So something that gives you a real sort of sense of satisfaction and happiness in the beginning, over time, doesn't give you the same hit anymore. You know, you need more and more. I mean, this is one of the underlying principles in addiction, of course. You know, what you first took or try isn't enough, so you go on to something heavier, you know, and you just get into this vicious spiral. And uh, and I think it's also about the sense of dependency we then develop towards these pleasures, you know. Even if we get everything just right, you know, you do meet people who say, I don't suffer, I've got everything just the way I want it. Even then, you know, it's, it's something's missing, it's unsatisfactory and it doesn't last, it never stays the same. So, and there's that dependency, you know, it's okay as long as you have it, but what happens if you lose it? Do you have <coughs> those qualities in the mind, do you have that inner resource, in a way, to face loss, to face change? And those qualities can be cultivated. So the beauty of this um, path <coughs> is that, uh, you know, it's about happiness, and, and very high happiness of enlightenment, <coughs> which is, you know, a bliss which none of us, I'm sure, can imagine. Uh, you know, complete contentment and freedom from wanting. But also, and, and things like deep states of samadhi, which are very powerful states of extreme happiness, which is a kind of contented, peaceful happiness. It's actually the lack of stimulation that creates the peace. Um, but the Buddha said that the, this happiness that can be cultivated <coughs> all the way along. And one of the things that struck me when I first encountered Ajahn Brahm's teachings was he was saying, just sit down and be content. I was like, just sit down and be content. But I'm supposed to sit down and then, right, and, okay, get comfortable, then, like, watch my breath, okay. Then we're going to move on to the body sensations. There was this sense of, I'm sitting down and I'm going to be moving on to something, you know, and he's saying, just sit down and be content. <coughs> so the object wasn't the breath, it wasn't the sensations, it was contentment. So I just sat down, okay, is there any contentment? And, you know, when you feel that you've got enough and that you don't need to get anywhere, you find, actually... It's very relaxing, <laughs> and there's a lot of contentment right here before we even begin. So later on, we're going to have a look at the gradual training in a minute, and um, the Buddha talks about different kinds of happiness. So the first one comes through observing sila, and sila we often think of as ethical precepts, but the reason I like this particular sutta, which is further away, um, 
is because it talks about the positive aspect of the sealer. So it's not just about restraining and not doing this, not doing that. Ajahn Brahm jokes like, you know, what does none mean? It means none of this, none of that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it can sometimes seem, you know, a bit dry. <laughs> and kind of, oh, can't do this, can't do that, what's the point? <laughs> but Sila's really great fun when you start getting into the positive aspect of it. And, uh, yeah. And so the gradual training is something that the Buddha um, discussed throughout the suttas, and it's actually one of the key um, teachings in the suttas. Often the Satipatthana sutta is seen as like the main sutta, but there is no kind of hierarchy of teaching. If anything, it's the ones which are repeated again and again and again, which are the core teachings. And of course, they include the whole Eightfold Path. So the gradual training is something that's talked about around eight or nine times in the Majjhima. And apparently the first 12 suttas or so of the Diginikaya, the long discourses, are all about the gradual training. And it's very beautiful because you can dip in anywhere and start to get benefit, you know. So the whole of the path becomes aligned. The whole of your life becomes aligned to the path. It's not that if you're not on your cushion you can't practice. You can. You can practice at the level of sila, at the level of right livelihood, right speech, right, <laughs> right everything, right attitude. And also, you know, before you get into the meditation, we can practice increasingly subtle kinds of sila, which starts to restrain the mind more and more and take us away from the world of sense of the senses. So it's a kind of beginning to get in touch with the happiness of the mind. So finding a new area, really, to explore. So I'll have a look in this uh, sutta directly, because I think the way the Buddha talks about some of the uh, precepts is just very beautifully put. So first of all, the gradual training, he sets up the right motivation for it. Okay, So there's this um, person called Pesa, and uh, he's speaking to the Buddha, and the Buddha's saying that there are four kinds of people in this world, okay? And the one is the, f the first one, or I might get it mixed up, but one is one who torments himself and torments others. The next one is he torments, or she torments herself, but not others. The next one torments others, but not oneself. And the last one torments neither oneself nor others. And then the Buddha says, which one of these people satisfies your mind? And then Pesa in this sutta says, well, the fourth one satisfies my mind. And he said, because all beings recoil from pain and desire pleasure. That's why the fourth one satisfies my mind. Because they're interested in not tormenting themselves or others. So notice that it's also themselves. <laughs> so if somebody was, you know, quite kind to everybody else but still was quite mean to themselves, that wouldn't have been enough because we also recoil from pain and pursue pleasure. That's just what we're all searching for actually is happiness. It's what drives us as human beings and as animals too, in all kind of forms of life. So I think it's really important to have this at the beginning of this uh, sequence of training and in a way it's establishing right motivation which is another translation for right intention. So, and also right view. It incorporates right view, you know, understanding that what we're interested in is happiness. So, with that motivation in mind, which is really a motivation of compassion and non-cruelty, uh, one becomes holy, having, what is it? Since he torments neither himself nor others, he's here and now hungerless, extinguished and cooled. And, experience, and abides experiencing bliss. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. I love those words, hungerless, extinguished, and mm -hmm. cooled. And that's exactly the opposite of craving, which literally means thirst, which is the same thing as hunger, really. It's that kind of needing to be quenched and looking to be quenched constantly. So, so then the sutta continues, and I'll... I'll talk about uh, the sealer a little bit, if I can find it. So the sealer is like the basis for, you know, for the practice. And if we don't cultivate this, or stop cultivating this at some point, our practice is going to be shaky. And we can be constantly trying to fix up faults in our practice, whereas actually the faults are in the conduct outside, in the normal life. 
So I think it's really good to know that you know there is groundwork to be done. There's a lot of preparation we can do before we come to the practice itself. To the by practice I mean sitting meditation or sati. Right. So the first thing in this sutta it says that one develops confidence in the teachings. So that's really nice because it's also the start of a sequence that goes throughout the suttas that the whole path is a natural process. One's confidence is in place, which is what I talked about in the beginning. You know, having this experience of suffering meeting the teachings and feeling, yes, I can really relate to that. That speaks to me. I have confidence that that must be true. There is suffering and there must be a way out. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. And that was the confidence that really took me through my path. It wasn't that I went to that retreat and everything was bright and shiny and, you know, I had bliss upon bliss. It wasn't at all like that. I could barely stand sometimes, but there was this confidence that this was the path. So the teaching starts... the the process starts with the confidence. And what's the next one? And then the next one is actually in this sutta because it's a teaching to the monastics, so it's going forth. <coughs> so, possessing the faith, she considers household life is crowded and dusty, life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life as utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, if you're a man, put on the yellow robe and go forth from home life into homelessness. So I told you it was a monastic uh, beauty parlour, so if anyone wants to have a go, it doesn't look bad, it's quite easy to keep. But, um, <laughs> but I'm not suggesting that anybody do this, or that even this part is necessarily... Um, you know, is absolutely necessary in order to um, continue the practice and to develop in the path of Dhamma. I think what it's really pointing at is um, developing simplicity, learning to live a simple life which is based on contentment rather than greed. And um, an example of this is uh, a bit of a harrowing example that I read recently, I think in The Independent, about uh, the state of the planet. Um, and it said, it very clearly kind of pointed to the cause this and it said by not reining in our material um, desires basically <coughs> greed um, we're causing substantial and irreversible damage to the planet which is going to result in massive human misery yeah. and it all leads back to that by not reining in our desires we're just consuming far more of the world's resources like in a social and demographically uneven way you know I mean it's one of the most tragic sort of things we have to see in our times and it's probably always been that way but with you know population increase it's just becoming more and more marked and with recent politics worldwide as well which we won't get into but you know there's something we can do ourselves and doing that it is a kind of way of expressing compassion to those who don't have so much and maybe you know the sort of food that we maybe waste every day could feed a family in India so I think this kind of idea of going forth is about abandoning the things that we don't need in the path and developing like deeper contentment within ourselves um, and coming out of those coarse defilements of greed. Actually, I don't like the word defilement, but maybe... Mm, I'll think of a better word. <laughs> okay. So once that's happened, then we start to practice the sila. And the Buddha already says that at this level of sila, we experience a bliss that is blameless. So it's the beginning of the refinement of happiness. So it's not the happiness of jhanas and enlightenment yet, but it's a bliss that's blameless. So that to me indicates something that's free from remorse. Perhaps it has a certain self-confidence or self-respect, or just a kind of um, glow that you get you know, from knowing that you're living the best way you can. You're not perfect, but you're doing your best. And I always said to my mum, actually, from a young age, I said, I just want to wake up and feel, like, happy to be alive and that I won't regret wasting my time. And I think that's the kind of feeling it can, you know, keeping Sila can give us. We know that we're trying to do our best, especially when it's motivated by compassion. We may not have the wisdom. I think my compassion is much stronger than my wisdom so far. But at least the motivation is correct. So... The couple of bits that I want to talk about here are, first of all, the um, abandoning the killing of living beings. But, as I say, this also goes into the positive aspect of each of the sealers. So, 
the positive aspect is with rod and weapon laid aside conscientious merciful she abides compassionate to all living beings so that's more than just not taking life you know, with rod and weapon laid aside and I think of that literally but I also think of it figuratively in terms of you know, the rods and weapons that we use in our speech which we'll go into more detail in but just that feeling that we need to defend ourselves or kind of attack other people and compassionate to all living beings I know some of the people here are mindfulness um, teachers and I think it's really good to read up on the sort of work that's been doing with compassionate mindfulness too. Ajahn Brahm calls that kindfulness, mm -hmm. sort of kindness and mindfulness combined. Um, and there's been really great results um, with adding compassion into the mindfulness training. So what they found, one of the results they found is that with um, straight mindfulness training we do develop more sensitivity to suffering. But sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean we're more resilient to it or more tolerant. Distress tolerance is the term they use. It doesn't necessarily increase. Um, also, with compassion training, we do develop that um, sensitivity to suffering, but distress tolerance does increase. And there's also a sense of... Um, oh, what's the word? It basically stimulates areas in the brain which are connected with reward and affiliation. So it means that we have a wholesome connection with suffering. We're developing a more wholesome connection, which is based on concern and a wish to alleviate suffering. And so the compassion and mindfulness training, which was trialed against the mindfulness training, showed that people become more altruistic, whereas the plain mindfulness didn't have that effect, which I think is very interesting. And of course, that doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, and, and how we practice is something... You know, it, it's hard to measure. Everybody will be practicing slightly differently, but I think it does show that if we bring more compassion and really focus on the attitude we bring to the practice, we can expect really good results. So it will actually connect us to others. <coughs> so our own suffering isn't something that exists in this bubble, you know, but it's something that connects us and helps us to care for the suffering of others and, and take steps to alleviate it. So it's not enough just to wish sometimes may all beings be happy, but what are we doing, you know, to actually... And it can be something so simple. We don't have to go out and start a, a homeless shelter, although if anybody, you know, that would be great, a Dhamma health homeless shelter or something. But, um, you know, just smiling at someone instead of kind of being grumpy, noticing, okay, there's someone walking past me, yeah, I feel a bit miserable, but hey, maybe they do too, why don't we just smile? And I often do that on the tube, and actually everybody smiles back. They're quite happy about it. It was nice with Ajahn Brown, because <laughs> we, we got to hang out all the time, actually, for about nine days. And we were on the tube one evening, <coughs> sitting next to these two um, women. I was sitting next to them. And they were obviously kind of coming back from, I don't know, a pub or something. And one of them was like, oh, I feel really sick. And we just started talking and joking to them and offering some things that we've been given, chocolate, you know. So I'm like, have some chocolate, have this, have that. And Ajahn was telling jokes. And it was just really lovely. The whole carriage started to join in, you know. And at the end, the drunk one was kind of gone. But her friend was like, it was so nice to meet you. It was so nice. She looked so grateful, you know, to have had some kind of help with this <laughs> situation. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah, and also I read recently something about compassion and empathy, which is m an interest for me because Anukampa actually means, our project is called Anukampa, and it actually means um, compassion, but it has the empathy aspect. It literally means like resonating with others. So it's like that sort of sense of tuning up to how a person feels and the compassionate response. So they found that compassion always has an aspect of empathy. But in some cases, the compassion is strong enough that you don't get sucked into people's problems. Whereas in other cases, empathizing too much can actually lead you to take on the other person's emotions to the extent that basically it's detrimental to you and the other. So it doesn't help anyone. So that's quite interesting too, that you know, some empathy is necessary, but it can move into em empathic distress, I think they call it which is probably quite common in sort of care professions. Yeah. So the compassion focuses on the outcome. It's the may that other be free from suffering, not just that person is suffering, I feel for you, but may you come out of it. It's that wish to see the end of suffering. It focuses on the end of suffering. 
So this is the thing about compassion and why it's so powerful. So then, of course, we have the uh, not stealing, um, but also giving. I think the colliery of stealing is obviously generosity. And generosity, I mean, for me as a nun, I can't be generous in material ways. So, but you can be generous with time. We can, you know, be generous with a smile, as I was saying before, giving a friend an ear. I think non-judgmental, being non-judgmental towards others is an act of generosity. And also, as a monastic, often my role is to receive. And sometimes that's been difficult because, you know, I don't, I want to feel I'm giving. But over time, I've realized that receiving is another form of giving because people want to give. And as I was saying before, sometimes we want to give um, some encouragement to someone. But when they don't receive it, it's actually, it's not pleasant because you've got this open heart. You want to connect. You want to sort of lift someone. And I had this experience in Perth during the rains. I was sort of expressing this encouragement and, and um, kind of, yeah, friendship towards another nun. And she just kept saying, no, 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 no. And I was like, can you please accept it? And every time she sort of said no, it was like, it was like this struggle going on in my heart, you know, energetically. It's like my heart was opening and then contract. Oh, and then finally she accepted it. And I, oh, it felt so nice. It felt really nice. So receiving is actually a gift to the person trying to give. And they have this very clear in Asian countries. You know, sometimes you go somewhere like Burma and think, oh, hang on a minute. All these sort of monks and perhaps some Westerners who are from well-to-do countries coming through our village, you know, coming through small villages where people barely feed themselves. And then you have people giving, you know, one teaspoon of rice, dressed up in all their best, you know, and giving something that's really hard to give. And people feel, well, that's not right. But for these villagers, that's self-respect, that's a sense of dignity and feeling that they have something to offer. And that's very beautiful and I think should be honoured. And I think they have the wisdom to know that that is actually, it's something that uplifts the mind. So they say the highest form of generosity is that which adorns the mind. So again, about beauty, you know, making the mind beautiful. Not that which wants something back or does something for show, like with your name in gold letters when you've donated £10,000 to Anno Camper. <laughs> That's not actually <laughs> generosity, you know. Generosity is giving something hard to give that's hard to give because we understand that makes the mind beautiful and we delight in that. And with that beauty, we can transpose it into our practice. So we're starting off our meditation already with some happiness in our mind. And it's, it's also the beginning of letting go. Giving away is a kind of letting go. Yeah. So that's about the giving. And then the time's moving very quickly, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to talk about speech because speech is, I think, one of the most subtle areas of Sila and one that we could work on for the rest of our lives and never get quite right. You know, sometimes it's better not to speak at all, actually, if we really want to get it right. <laughs> Isn't it? That's why we do retreats, because it's so easy on a retreat. We can't break our sila. <laughs> it's not because otherwise we'll go to the off-license. It's because we'll open our mouths, you know? <laughs> so it's quite, you know, it, it's all too easy to keep your mouth shut, though. So, and there is such a thing as right speech, which can be also a promoter of happiness and harmony and friendship and beauty in the world. So speech is very powerful. And it's also the place where we are in danger of fault-finding and criticising. And I think often in the suttas, people get confused because there's a part which says one, if one is in the training as a monastic, but it would apply to the lay people too, anyone who's serious about developing in Dhamma, it says we should be open to, um, sometimes it calls it reproval, I prefer sort of admonishment, um, which basically means receiving feedback. So sometimes people think, great, everybody's meant to be open to receiving feedback. Let me give them some feedback. You know? I can see this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. Let me tell them it's for their good. You know? But often, if we're honest with ourselves, it's because we're pretty irritated, actually. <laughs> and so I think we have to be really careful. And the Buddha talks about um, five methods to check, check in with ourselves before we give the feedback. Right. The first one, which stops most of the feedback, is uh, <laughs> do we have the same fault ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> so usually we do, and that's why we see it in the other. That's precisely what we're seeing in the other, is what we haven't accepted within ourselves. So if we're really honest about that, that already humbles us. We get back in our heart or in our little meditation room, and we work on ourselves. Right. So we work on ourselves first. 
Then the next one is that do we have meta in the heart? So again, motivation, where's it coming from? Next one is delivery, are we doing it gently? The next one is the right time and place. So maybe I don't sort of criticise any of you here in public, but afterwards I'll have a word. <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> So you don't do it in public. And also, right time means try to do it when the person's in a good mood. Even maybe ask permission. This is something we try to do in monasteries. We try to sort of ask, you know, would it be okay if I just sort of um, shared something with you? You know, and put that person at ease rather than, you know, immediately stirring up their defence and, and sort of fear. Because they're never going to receive anything that way. They're just going to throw it straight back. So that's about the time and the place. And then the last one, I think, was to do with... Um, it should be something that's genuinely helpful. So in a monastery, I mean, it depends on the monastery, but and it depends how you define training. A lot of places feel that training means you've got to do everything a certain way, and it's usually the top dog's way, or, the, sorry, the top nun or monk's way. <laughs> Ajahn Brown's on those calls, the abbess. If she's a bit controlling, he says the abyss, not the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be careful because I'm going to be an abyss or an abyss. So, um, you know, not about, oh, you didn't clean the toilet with the stuff that I like you to clean it with, or you spray, you know, you didn't wipe the seat with the right cloth. It's more about things connected with our liberation. So if we really see that a person has a certain habit that just keeps on creating a lot of misery for themselves and others, we might like to point it out in these ways. But again, have you got the same thought yourself? and to be very humble about that. So I'll just read out, I mean, with those kind of uh, premises in mind, those kind of like golden rules, really, um, I'll speak about what the Buddha says here. So abandoning false speech, there's five kinds of speech, or four kinds, actually. The false speech, the harsh speech, the... what is it? False speech, harsh speech, malicious speech, and gossip, okay? So, abandoning false speech, I'm going to say she, abstains from false speech. She speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world. So the opposite of false speech is trustworthiness, which is a gift, giving others the gift of trust. Abandoning malicious speech, she abstains from malicious speech, does not repeat elsewhere what she's heard here in order to divide those people from these, nor does she repeat to these people what she's heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. She is one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendship, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights, co delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. Which is so lovely, and I think... That shows the emphasis on harmony and living in a harmonious monastery or household or group of friends. It's, it's about the Kalyanamitta, the living with others who you know, have the same um, interests and who are not you know, interested in kind of picking fault with everything. So a lot of work in monasteries, you know, when they don't have this principle of harmony very clear, is, is working with all these interpersonal dynamics and all the complexities that arise from that. And it's... You know, a lot of the time can be spent on that, and you never get to actually meditate. Or if you do, you just, oh, she said this to, oh, and he's in, oh, you know, how am I going to fix these problems? So this is really, you know, all these sealers are creating that groundwork so that when we get back to our cushion, we can just meditate. We don't have unfinished business. So then, abandoning harsh speech, she abstains from harsh speech. She speaks words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable, as go to the heart, a courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. So that's obviously, you know, a source of happiness. Pleasing, lovable, go to the heart. So we can, speech is powerful, and we can, you know, create a lot of happiness through our speech. And then abandoning gossip, she abstains from gossip, speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and discipline at the right time. She speaks words that are worth recording, reasonable, moderate and beneficial. Which reminds me that moderation means not speaking too much. <laughs> so I realise I'm going over a little bit and we need to meditate before lunch. But just very quickly to wind up the gradual training for now. 
Um, the next thing after the sila is very interesting because it's about sense restraint, and this is something we focus on a lot in monastic life, and also in retreat centres. You know, when you go on retreat, you tend to guard the senses, and guarding the senses, sense restraint, it doesn't mean not looking at anything or not hearing anything. You know, the window's open; it's okay. It's not about <laughs> not hearing. We have to practice sense restraint in the world, not away from it. But sense restraint, what it means is not attending to the signs and features in a way that creates, uh, that causes the unwholesome to increase and the wholesome to decrease. So it's already getting into the realm of perception and attitude and kind of what we pick up from the input that's coming in. So we can choose to attend to various aspects of a person or a situation or just a normal object, you know, and say like a piece of litter, we look at it and ooh, horrible, you know, but we can attend to it in a different way. A piece of litter is kind of like the higher training. <laughs> 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 but say a beautiful leaf or something, you know, how do we look at it? Do we just look at it as an old brown crispy bit of rubbish on the road or do we see it's, you know, the richness of the colours and the crunch under the feet? So it's how we attend, but also in terms of things like uh, lust, you know, we can look at a person in a certain way. We can look at their male or female attributes, as it says in the suttas, or we can listen to the things that arouse that lust or arouse that aversion, or we can turn to something else. So this one always comes hand in hand with sati, with mindfulness. So mindfulness kind of shows us the effect of whatever's coming in at the sense doors and what's happening in our mind and sense restraint guides our attention away from the things that are generating unwholesome thoughts or basically greed, hatred and <laughs> delusion. So it's about how we attend to things rather than cutting ourselves off from things. And this is just more and more kind of uh, bringing ourselves more into the mental world and starting to see the effect of the external on the internal so that when we sit down to meditate, we're, we've already got a certain amount of um, composure and a happiness. So the happiness that's talked about here is unsullied happiness, which is quite interesting. So it's just a little bit deeper than the blameless happiness. And it's a preparation for the meditation. It's a calming. So from there, we then go into abandoning the hindrances and then samadhi, which are the states of jhanas, which a lot of people don't talk about, but are an absolutely vital part of the early Buddhist teachings. And from the jhanas, which are very high states of happiness, when the hindrances are removed, we have the chance to actually see things as they are. So to see things we don't necessarily like to see, such as non-self and impermanence and suffering, because our mind is resourced through the samadhi practice. So this is a whole sequential approach to refining happiness <coughs> and to getting our mind to the point where it's so soft and malleable that we're able and ready to see deeper into the way things are. <laughs> <laughs>